Going inside the issues of our community, this is Local 12 Newsmakers. And this is the vision for phase one and then a massing study of the future phases of the West towards Paul Brown Stadium. Again, a true 24-7, 365 community where people live, work, play, and invite guests. They'll invite 50,000 guests on some weekends to their community. In between, this will be a working, living, fun place to live. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. Last Monday afternoon, AIG Carter, the preferred development team selected by the bank's working group, presented their preliminary architectural vision for the Cincinnati Central Riverfront. The plan calls for starting on the two blocks between Great American Ballpark and the Freedom Center. On the northern block will be 100 residential units with about 255 on the southern block and about 75,000 square feet of retail, including two new riverfront uh, restaurants in front of the Freedom Center. Before the public presentation was made, a group of religious and labor leaders addressed the press about their expectations for jobs and job training for low-income people. We want to see that 50% of the workers down on the bank's project come from Hamilton County. We're paying taxes here in this county and should have opportunity to benefit from that project. To discuss the status of the banks at this moment, I am joined this morning by David Pepper, a member of the Hamilton County Commission, and David Crowley, a member of the Cincinnati City Council. Uh, welcome back to Newsmakers. Uh, this was the architectural plan that we saw on Monday. Uh, so we should judge it, I think, or you know, begin by just saying, what did you think of the architecture? There was there were some earlier plans that we've seen. I don't think they were as firm as this one. So, but what do you think of the architecture, David? Well, first, I'm not an architect, and w one of the things I asked the group was not just to show me the drawings, but to show me, you know, pictures of other places that look like uh, what they're planning here. And they showed parts of Atlanta that they've done and other places. Overall, I was impressed. I think it's. Um, it's an exciting combination of things they're planning to put down there between retail office and, and entertainment and residential. And, and I actually liked what I saw. Okay. Uh, Dan, I, I did visit the places in Atlanta, Atlanta Square and um, Lindbergh Square, I believe it was. Um, and, I, and there are a lot of things I liked about that. To be honest with you, I didn't focus a whole lot the other day at the, on the architectural aspects of it. But I, I would say this. I think it's going to be important as to how the architecture of the banks relates to Center City. I mean, if it's, if it's going to be so stark and so different, you know, there's allowed to be a disconnect there. And while we, we don't want to imitate the Central Business District, we do want to be complementary, I believe. And so I think that's the way we should look at that. I actually would <coughs> add to that. I actually think one of the changes <coughs> between the older plans and this is it will be more of a continuity because you'll see some higher buildings closer to the, you know, Third Street side. <coughs> and I do think actually the changes there may be more continuity than there used to be. So there's um, not some So it's, they don't want it to be some stark, you know, south or north of Third Street divide. Yeah. The whole point is to have it be seamless. And I actually think perhaps one, one benefit of the new plans is that it is more of a, of a continuous motion from downtown. Based on one of the questions that was asked uh, the other day too, I think there is, uh, from what I can hear, a commitment to green architecture here, oh, yeah. in which I think at this stage would be crazy not oh, yeah. to yeah. have that commitment. Is that your understanding, too? Oh, yeah, very strongly. Yeah, yeah I was, that was a good question at the meeting yeah. and a good answer. I, I would just say, Dan, on the architecture, to finally, um, one of the things now I'm starting to hear about is that, you know, David talked about the height of the buildings closer to the Central Business District. Well, some folks from the Central Business District are questioning now whether that's going to be so much that it's going to block the, the uh, view. You know, all of these, whatever you say about them, um, they're just pretty pictures unless we mm -hmm. can get to uh, the funding package. And the goal is by May 15th to right. get to that okay. funding package. Now, I know you're not in the meetings. You're not part of the bank's <coughs> working group. You'll be reviewing that. But what's your understanding? Are things moving in a direction that you are hopeful about the funding package? Yeah, I'm very hopeful right now about the whole project. Uh, we are as close as we've ever been. I know what citizens are saying, what you just said, which is we've seen these drawings for years and nothing else. So they're, they're not holding their breath for results. We have to deliver results, and frankly, it's like the movie Apollo 13. You know, there's no room for failure here. We have to succeed. I think we will. Now, the, the finances are maybe the toughest part. There are a lot of big issues, but getting the package together in a responsible way where we know it will get done, and it basically is a combination of tax increment financing, parking revenue, uh, federal and state grants 
and also the private equity part, and that's being worked on. And frankly, the the bank's working group is five people who ha we're now seven who haven't always agreed on everything. But I think there's been a healthy tension of people with very strong opinions about how this would work, and those have been slowly been working out over recent months. Dave, uh, in that private equity part, mm -hmm. what was being said the other day was about 85 to 100 million dollars from the developers themselves putting <laughs> private money in. Does that sound like the right ballpark? Uh, well, David said before he was no expert on architecture, and I'm no expert on financing, but uh, you know, based on what I know and what comparables I've looked at, it, it seems reasonable. And, and you know, I, there, there ought to be a lot of opportunities for equity investment in this, not, not only with big you know, insurance companies and, and developers who can bring much cash to the game, but for, for lots of folks. And, and one of the things, Dan, I guess we'll talk about this in a minute under the empowerment agreement, the empowerment agreement calls for equity positions by the same small business um, uh, enterprises and women to business enterprises that want a piece of the work action. They also want to have the opportunity if they have the capacity. Piece of the ownership. Yeah, be in the ownership, exactly. Let, let me, before we move on to those okay. issues, I want to ask one more question, and that is what I see as sort of a reality check. And that, I imagine the basin, that there's four development zones the banks being one, mm -hmm. Central Business District being another, over the Rhine being a third, and the Northern Kentucky Riverfront being mm -hmm. a fourth. Mm -hmm. Northern Kentucky Riverfront, there's a lot happening over sure. there. Are we, and, and put the final piece of context here, we're a slow growth region. Mm -hmm. Is there enough energy, people, and resources to develop the banks without killing off one of those other four zones? I think the answer is yes, as long as we're smart about it. We're not. If we created three zones, let's say on the Ohio side, that we're trying to do the exact same thing, it would be a problem. But you know, if we do our job and over the Rhine, it should be a, a largely residential neighborhood. It w it won't be offering the same kind of things as as the banks. But a lot of the people who would move to over the Rhine would be customers of a lot of the entertainment yeah. at the banks. The fact that we want to get people living. In the banks, having the movie theater across the river at Newport and Levy could be the, one of the best ways to get them to live there. So if we do it right, it's not a zero-sum game. These different things can complement each other. One other thing, though, that I think has to be talked about, this came up on Monday as well. We also aren't doing a good job if we don't figure out a way to connect all these different mm -hmm. venues together. And that's mm -hmm. when we start talking about this this trolley idea, or whatever we call yeah, it. Streetcar. Streetcar street that runs between these different. That is how you really take these independent development projects and really supercharge them so people can Incredibly connect critical. between all mm -hmm. four of the mm -hmm. locations. I want to move on because I'm aware of time. and I, th th There's some, been some very important issues about uh, the whole question of participation here and I, w I want to get at that a little bit. Okay. In response to a question about minority opportunity, Trent Germano, the spokesperson for Carter Real Estate, cited their track record of consistently letting 20 percent or more of the subcontracts to minority firms. In response, Reverend Gregory Chandler, the president of Amos, who was on the show a few weeks ago, pressed Germano on their track record and commitment to workplace development, employment training for low-income people. Our concern is about those who live in the community, who pay taxes in the community, whether they will have opportunities to gain employment that will enable them to work their way out of poverty. We don't have any um, experience in that area that shows we've done certain things and aspired to certain goals and frankly have not been challenged with it before. But uh, as I did respond at the very end of my remarks, uh, we do understand the importance of that and we're having a lot of those conversations. So we have a, a very open mind about how to approach it. Dave, you stood with uh, the people from labor, the religious uh, groups, uh, Amos, who were concerned before this, uh, this meeting the other day. How did you feel about what you heard? And I think that was the key sentence that everybody was paying attention to. How did you feel? How did you come out? Disappointed. Disappointed. Underwhelmed. I said to the person sitting next to me when Trent made his comments, I said, uh, that was weak. Uh, I, I would have, and I visited and talked with them in Atlanta, as I said before, Dan, and when we, particularly Steve Love and I were down there together, this was months ago, we talked about, you know, our interest in making sure low-income minority people had a significant opportunity to benefit and to contribute to this themselves. 
And, you know, we were reassured that those folks working in Atlanta, working given the minority population of that area, that that was just kind of second nature to them. And so hearing this answer, it was disappointing from what my expectation level had been. Now, I think he tried to recoup and say, well, we're, we're open to this, we're right. working. You the know. second part of that. But, but I, I thought he lost a big opportunity not to come on a little more forcefully. I, I frankly wasn't dis disappointed. I think he said they have a very good track record with minority inclusion. Some of the issues we're bringing up now, we're trying to have a cutting edge solution around workforce development and training mm -hmm. that is frankly pretty new for, for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I think he was trying to be candid mm -hmm. about they hadn't done something exactly like that before, but my view is just like all the other issues, we can solve this. We have good representation on the bank's working group of, of people who are going to bring up this issue and it'll be part of the ultimate agreement. So. Well, should, should this sort of concern be the concern of the developer? As opposed, there's a lot of workplace development as mm -hmm. Cincinnati works. There's a lot of people doing this. Should this be the developer's responsibility? Well, I, I, think, I think the developer has yeah. to know it's important. I think he was saying mm -hmm. he, he believes it is. He hasn't seen exactly the kind of uh, solutions that are being put forward here, and I think he was being honest about that. But this is not something that I think will get in the way of us finalizing this agreement. I think this is something that will be talked through in the next 30 days or so, and we'll get it done. But I don't think, um, I, I, I honestly admired him for saying, well, we haven't done something exactly like that before. That is the other way. Right, but that is the willing, other way of seeing right, that. It's but we're candid. willing to do this, and I know that whether it was Bob Castellini or all seven members of the working group, they have said, and they are now meeting with folks like Bob Richardson, who's mm -hmm. obviously mm -hmm. an expert on these labor issues, mm -hmm. to get something done that we can all vote for right. when it comes to us. David, we only have about 45 seconds left. What's going to have to happen for those uh, Steve Love, Bob Richardson inside that group mm -hmm. in order to get satisfactory? Well, I, I think that it's going to have to be impressed again on the developer's mind that this is really important. And, and, and it's ironic that he was standing in the convention center, which had a, like a 30% involvement from, right. you know, and, and so like 20% is we're past that goal. Let's get more serious. So it's going to be a challenge. I think this is a big company. They can rise to the challenge. And I would hope that our team pushes them that way. Okay. Well, thank you very much. This is thank very you. complex. And obviously the middle of May, we're going to need to talk again. <laughs> so anyway, sure, sure, this was Thank you. Stay tuned. After the break, a Pulitzer Prize winning historian whose book documents the role of Cincinnati's Dr. Albert Sabin in defeating polio. In the 1940s and 50s, summertime in America was a time of worry, not relaxation. American parents lived with the constant threat that polio might strike their children, dooming them to a life defined by leg braces and crutches, or even worse, an iron lung. Welcome back. The complex ways in which America responded to polio is the focus of a new book entitled Polio, an American Story which was awarded the 2006 Pulitzer Prize in History, and it was by, written by David Oshinsky. On Thursday night, Professor Oshinsky delivered the annual Distinguished Historian Lecture at the Cincinnati Museum Center. Professor Oshinsky holds the Jack S. Blanton Chair of History at the University of Texas in Austin. He has also written A Conspiracy So Immense, The World of Joe McCarthy, and Worse Than Slavery, Parchman Farm and the Ordeal of Jim Crow Justice. David, welcome to Cincinnati. Glad to be here. And welcome uh, to Newsmakers. You know, it's you and I are old enough to remember America before there were any vaccines for polio. Give a little bit of a sense of what you remember about that. Well, I grew up in New York City, and what I remember most is that the summer plague would descend around Memorial Day, and we would actually have newspapers give what seemed like baseball box scores of the number of kids with polio, and it would start rising in June and get higher in July and spike in August. And these were people who had been actually delivered to hospitals. They, they, were, they were almost dead and in paralytic shape. And then by Labor Day, the numbers would, would literally break and come down, and the summer plague was over. But in those months, in June, July, and August, not only were thousands of children paralyzed, and some of whom died, but as you noted, uh, you couldn't go swimming, you couldn't go to the movies, you had to stay out of crowds. 
My mother uh, didn't let me make new friends because she assumed I had the germs of old friends and there was no reason to get tricky with new ones. And what, was, what were the options if a person was a victim of polio? Was there anything that could really be done for them after the fact that they had polio that was effective? No, po polio really had, uh, there was no prevention and no cure. If you, um, right afterwards, uh, if they got to the, the, the patient immediately, uh, they could use hot packs, the Sister Kenny method. They could try to relax the muscles and re-educate them. But in fact, if you had serious paralytic polio, there was nothing you could do. Um, basically, your limbs remain paralyzed for the rest of your life. So really, the drive was to find some way to prevent polio, not to cure, cure it after the fact. Th that, that is correct. Um, there really was no uh, cure, uh, and, and none has ever been found. What you really needed was a vaccine. In this case, we got two vaccines that simply could uh, spur antibody production in your system to fight the virus, and therefore you simply would not get the disease. Now we happen to be in Cincinnati, so we have a peculiar connection with this because of Dr. Albert Sabin doing his work here. Uh, and two of the great personalities in this story are Dr. Jonas Salk, whose lab was at the University of Pittsburgh, and developed the killed virus vaccine in 1954 and 55, and Dr. Albert Sabin, who worked here at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. Dr. Sabin was committed to a live, attenuated, or weakened vaccine that was to be taken orally, mimicking the natural path of the infection. Now, these two vaccines, uh, were they fundamentally different in, in the way they operated? Was it important that there were two and that they were so different? Or, or were they that different? Well, they were. Um, as you mentioned, Sabin's vaccine recreated a natural infection and therefore hopefully would give you a lifetime of immunity through high antibody production. Salks was seen as the kind of vaccine that was more of a stopgap measure, which kind of tricked the immune system into producing uh, uh, antibodies, but never really got at the notion of natural infection. Sabin's vaccine was the stronger vaccine. The beauty of Sabin's vaccine as well is that it worked immediately so that if it were an epidemic in a community and you started giving live polio virus vaccine, you could stop that infection and that spread of you that epidemic. You could cut it off by giving this weakened. Th th that, that is correct. It also, because you don't need a needle, because it is given on the tongue and goes down through the gut. It's particularly in, uh, in poor areas, in developing areas, you really, needles are very, very tricky and Sabin's vaccine is more effective and it's cheaper. The problem with Sabin's vaccine, and there was only one real problem, is that in a teeny, teeny percentage of cases, it would actually give the person polio. In other words, you were talking about live virus going through the system, and maybe one out of two million kids would actually get a full-blown case of polio from the vaccine. One out of? Two million. Two million. Right, it's, the numbers were very And let's low. remember that by uh, the 1950, 50 to 54, the rate on, for the entire population was up to 32, 35 per 100,000. That is correct. So this is a, even with that little bit of a problem, uh, there was a big. Uh oh, Sabin's vaccine, I mean, he was a wonderful scientist and his vaccine was extraordinarily effective. We've gone back ironically in the United States today to the Salk vaccine. What the Sabin vaccine was to get the numbers down to literally two dozen in the whole country. And now we have a stronger version of the Salk vaccine that has brought the numbers down to zero. We have not had a case of polio in the Western Hemisphere since 1990. So it's sort of the coordination of these two vaccines together that has ended the disease. Now one of the things about Dr. Sabin and Dr. Salk, and I had the privilege of interviewing Dr. Sabin in 1990, uh, a few years before he died, and he wanted to make sure that I s understood that Salk was wrong. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the two personalities, Dr. Sabin's combative personality, came through even 40 years later when I did that interview, and he wanted to tell me about the National Institute of Infantile Paralysis uh, and their support and the way they acted after 1954 and 55 <coughs> when Dr. Salk's killed vaccine, uh, virus vaccine came out. Take a look at this. When it became evident that the oral vaccine had to be used as a means of eliminating poliomyelitis, not just preventing. 
the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, in effect, was trying to obstruct to it in it. every possible way. We had trouble hearing that in the studio, but what he was saying was that once the Salk vaccine came out, for all sorts of reasons, the foundation, the infantile paral National Infantile Paralysis Foundation, March of Dimes, that was a popular front, um, threw their weight to Salk and threw roadblocks in his way, did everything they could, he says, to prevent him from moving forward. Well, I think what happened is that they really funded both scientists and this was a race and Salk who had the simpler vaccine got there first and once Salk had this vaccine the March of Dimes went with it and really started the biggest public health experiment in American history with this vaccine which kind of left Sabin out in the left field what Sabin did which was absolutely extraordinary was at the height of the Cold War he actually went to the Soviet Union to test his vaccine and he tested it on you know millions upon millions of children there and it was phenomenally effective it was so effective the results were so good that both the American Medical Association and the federal government decided to license the Sabin vaccine and for a long time that became the vaccine of choice I think what you have to understand Dan is that this was a rivalry of two egocentric, brilliant scientists, each of whom believed he was correct, and each of whom was quite willing to throw roadblocks in the face of the other. And this went on not only up till 54, but as you noted, for the rest of their lives. And it probably in some ways is the harshest most virulent feud in American medical history. And because of the nature of polio and the way the American society responded to polio with such a public effort to raise money, the March of Dimes, to, to, to find a, uh, a prevention, uh, the way that it was linked with President Roosevelt, uh, this, this feud, this scientific feud that could have been happening in laboratories and in scholarly journals really became a public feud. It did. And what is interesting, and I try to show in my book, is that Sabin had the support of most of the medical community. He was the scientist scientist. They believed that his was the better vaccine and that he did not look for publicity. He stayed in his laboratory. Jonas Salk, on the other hand, was more of the people scientist. He was the one the people gravitated to. He was the one, sort of the hero in the white lab coat that the March of Dimes would always trot out. And this really became a kind of feud where Sabin had the scientific community on his side and Salk had the March of Dimes and basically the public on his side. And it remained that way throughout their lives. Jonas Salk is probably better known and Albert Sabin among scientists is better respected. Mm. You know, at the at, in that interview, I want to play one more clip from Dr. Sabin where he wanted to tell me what he thought was the key thing about his oral vaccine. Let's take a listen. Yeah. This vaccine is unique and different from any other is that it spreads to the population outside. No other human vaccine does that. So what he's talking about was what he called the herd effect, that yes. if people took the Sabin vaccine, that it would then spread to other people who didn't get the Sabin vaccine either, even. So it was a way of uh, preventing it's a it. It's a kind of secondary immunity. Yeah. That, that is correct. In other words, you might not take the Sabin vaccine, but if your neighbor does and he excretes some of that live virus into the environment, he is going to get a kind of secondary immunity. And there really is, it is a kind of herd immunity. And there's truth to that, that you can vaccinate large parts of the population that in fact have not taken the vaccine itself. Of course, if you're an anti-vaccination person yeah. uh, as well, it means just the opposite. You're being exposed to vaccine and virus you don't want to be. I know I'm running out of time. I just want to ask one more question. Sure. I'm going to go over a little bit. But in 1987, the World Health Organization uh, started a campaign to eradicate, and that's literally the word they use, eradicate polio from the face of the earth. Where do we stand on that? That's a very good question. We have not eradicated it. The March of Dimes has sort of stepped out of the picture and going elsewhere. The Rotary Clubs have come in. They've done a phenomenal job. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's involved. The World Health Organization's involved. Polio is still there. It's still endemic in parts of Africa, Pakistan, India. Um, these are developing countries. It's very hard to get vaccine to rural people. There's a, a kind of cultural resistance in some areas to vaccination. The hope had been that by 2000, 
polio would be wiped off the face of the earth and it was 2004. Now it's 2010. The hope is that if governments, particularly in Africa and Asia, get behind this, thank God for Dr. Sabin, thank God for Dr. Salk, we'll wipe polio off the face of the earth. David, thank you uh, for being here today and thank you for this book. I can tell you that if you like a good read about uh, the middle decades of the 20th century in Cincinnati, this is insightful and it's a really easy, interesting book to read. It's a great history book. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. And thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next week to, to meet the women and men working to shape our community for the future. Have a good week. <laughs>